Hey, it's Ray at DCRainmaker.com, and today you get a full in-depth review and 17 new things to know about the new Garmin Phoenix 7 Series. Now, I've been using these watches the past month and a half, out swim, bike, run, hiking, doing all the things, both outdoors and indoors, to figure out where these watches work well and where they still need a little bit of love. Now, I'm gonna take you through all the new features, explain how they work, and because this video isn't sponsored in any way, shape, or form, I'm gonna tell you the good, the bad, and the ugly as well. Now, in addition to that, Garmin also released a new Epic Series watch, which is essentially a Phoenix 7 Series with an AMOLED display. And I've got a separate video on that up in the corner there, a full in-depth review, as well as a second video that compares the Phoenix 7 Series to the Epic with all the nitty gritty details in terms of all those nuances that might not be so obvious unless you've used it for quite a while. Now, before we get into all those new features, we first need to talk about all the models because there is a lot to choose from. But the general concept remains the same as the Phoenix 6 series. You have the 7S, which is a smaller watch. You have the 7 in the middle and the 7X at the upper end from a size standpoint. And then for each of those three watches, there's both a solar as well as a solar sapphire edition. And then sapphire not only indicates the actual glass on the surface of the watch, but also more importantly, in my opinion, the fact that it has multi-band GPS as well as larger storage. And we'll talk about what all that means a little bit later on in the review. Now, to be clear, all of the models, whether they are the base models, the solar, the sapphire models, all have storage, all have maps, all have music, and all have contactless payments. So pricing wise, here's a quick chart showing you all those prices from $699 up to $1199. As you can see, there are way too many models to try to read off, so I'll just let you do that by yourself by hitting the pause button. That's about a $100 increase over the past with the Phoenix 6 series, likely because of the fact they all have storage on there as well as maps and music. Okay, so with pricing out of the way, let's talk about some of these new features. And the first feature is the new touchscreen. It's still a color screen like in the past, but now it has touch on it. And it still has buttons like in the past, but now now you can use both buttons or touch however you see fit. Probably the most useful scenario for the touchscreen is simply maps. While you're out hiking like this, I can just simply swipe on the screen and move around to see where I am on the map. It's relatively similar in that context to what Coros has done with their Coros Vertex 2 or frankly any other touch watch in the past couple of years. You can of course also use the touch to swipe through the menus on the watch and move around and all the things you would normally expect, but Garmin's built in a ton of different options if you want to turn off the touch. So by default, for example, when you go out for a workout for the very first time, touch is actually disabled unless you explicitly enable it for that particular workout profile. And then it'll save your settings for that workout profile from there on out. Similarly, you can go ahead and disable touch while you're asleep, for example, so that you don't accidentally like touch your watch and do something weird to it. Uh, there's lots of ways you can customize this. So if you're not really a touch person, you don't have to use it. In terms of touchscreen responsiveness, it's pretty good. Whether it be dry or wet, I haven't had any real issues there. Uh, my overall preference though is just to use buttons, mainly because if I'm open water swimming or if I'm doing something in cold weather with gloves, I just know it's easier to use the buttons and they work every single time. But ultimately, now you have the choice to do whatever you want. And hey, a quick note, if you're finding this video interesting, useful, informative, or something like that, go ahead and consider subscribing down at the bottom there or hit the like button. Both of those really do help out this channel and the video quite a bit. Next up, we got probably the coolest geek feature, if you will, on the Phoenix 7 series, which is the new flashlight. Uh, now this is something that sounds like vaguely silly at first, but it's actually super useful in real world scenarios. So this is only on the Phoenix 7X, so the larger edition. Now the flashlight has three kind of core cases. Uh, the first one is simply just a flashlight to use day to day around the house, whatever you might need to do. I've used it like changing a baby's diaper at night. Like that sort of like sounds silly. Walking around the house, you just double tap the button there and it turns on the flashlight. There are two white LEDs on the front as well as one red LEDs. And in terms of brightness, it's actually not much different than my phone. It's pretty much in the same ballpark there and I can use it in roughly the same way. Uh, and you can control the brightness and what the settings are in the menus. The second scenario using the flashlight is in sports. And within that, you've got a bunch of different blink and strobe modes that you can choose from. You also have one for running where it actually will match your cadence. And in theory, it'll go ahead and show the white light while your wrist is forward and then the red light while your wrist is back. I'd say that while the execution of that isn't quite exact, it gets the point across. Whether I'm running on trails or in the city or on the side of a bike path, people at least know I'm there and it's handy if I don't have a separate light while I'm running. I've also used the flashlight in my bike when I was a little bit later than I expected to and my batteries were dead in my bike lights. Uh, so that's something that you can do as well. And then the third scenario is an SOS signal that you can trigger in emergency cases. And I know some will say a flashlight on a wearable is silly, but it's no more silly than a flashlight on a phone because now I can actually use my hands while I'm doing something. Uh, and it's certainly bright enough to light up the general area around what I'm doing for kind of impromptu stuff. The next new feature is the multi-band GPS or sometimes called dual frequency GPS. Essentially, it is the holy grail of GPS accuracy. At least that's the theory anyways. The idea being that you can dramatically increase the number of GPS satellites that you have access to to ensure 
turn, get a better position. But there's a catch here. In fact, probably a couple different catches. The first is that it's only available on the Sapphire models. So assuming you've got the Sapphire Edition, you can go ahead and enable it in the sport profile for a given sport or enable it watch wide. And the way it works, you go down into the satellite settings and you'll see an option there for all systems plus multiband. That means it's gonna use everything it's got and it's gonna burn through way more battery doing that. In fact, you can see on the screen here some very quick battery comparisons between multiband and non-multiband uh, in terms of what that burns. But what about accuracy? Now, overall, in my testing of multiband GPS, including the Coros Vertex 2, as well as the Epix and the Phoenix 7 series, I'm like mostly shrug. I mean, yeah, it's generally pretty good, but it's also generally not like incredible spectacular. Uh, there are certainly cases, very few cases for like very short distances next to some cliffs or things like that, where it might be slightly better. And I say might because there's other times where I've shown it's not better. It's just the same as any other GPS watch over the last couple years. And in fact, if you want to dive into all my GPS tracks over the past month and a half from swim to bike to run, cliffs, open water, you name it, that's linked all down there in the bottom of the description. Next up, there's the new up ahead feature. This allows you to go ahead and put predefined icons along with waypoint names in your routes that you see on a glanceable page while you're out hiking or doing whatever sport it is that you want to do. Of course, waypoints are nothing new to GPS watches. They've been around for many, many years. What Garmin has done here, though, is just made of a simple glanceable sheet that you can quickly get to and figure out how far it is to that next waypoint. So here's an example from a couple days ago where I created a route first on Komoot and then I imported it to Garmin Connect. From there, I assigned a bunch of different waypoints. They've got roughly 50 or so different types to choose from that are standardized and then I can add whatever names I want to from a tech standpoint. So the icons are predefined but you can add whatever the heck names that you want. You can do this on both Garmin Connect or as well as Garmin Connect Mobile. Once you're out in the trail you see the distance to the next waypoint as well as additional waypoints beyond that and then once you pass a given waypoint it'll make a little chirp letting you know you passed it and then continue on to the next waypoint. Okay so the next feature is the new map manager uh, and this is notable because all models now have maps for all places in the world. So the main difference though is that if you have a base model or a solar model without the sapphire this is true of both the phoenix 7 or the epix then you have 16 gigs of storage versus the sapphire editions have 32 gigs of storage and the reason that matters here is that garmin has not preloaded the maps on the 16 gig editions i'll put a quick size estimate on the size of those maps up on the screen right now but you can basically see that you can't necessarily download all of north america and all of europe onto the same watch at the same time i wish that garmin would split apart north america and perhaps canada and the u.s so you could do that still the key thing here though is the fact that you're getting all the maps you want to in the world for free. They're the topo active maps, so they include the popularity routing and all the data that Garmin has from their back end about which trails people actually use. It's worth noting, however, that these downloads over Wi-Fi are incredibly slow. You're looking at roughly one hour per two to two and a half gigs. So North America, Europe is going to take you over four hours to download. So next up is a new stamina feature. Think of this as like body battery, but for just a given workout or race. The idea here being that it's tracking two core things, your long-term potential energy and your short-term potential energy. For example, in an interval workout, that short-term stamina is going to fluctuate a lot. As you go ahead and you do a hard interval and then you recover, it's going to recover that potential stamina and then you do it again, rinse, repeat all the way to the end. But in the case of a longer-term endurance race or workout, you're going to see that long-term energy decline almost at the exact same rate as your potential short-term energy. And the way it does that, it shows you how much time or intensity you've left at that exact moment for that current intensity. Now, here's an example from an interval workout of mine back a little while ago. And you can see how, as I went through that interval workout, my overall long-term continued to decrease steadily but my short term went up and down as it went through the different intervals. Meanwhile, this ride from yesterday was an epic seven hour long ride up top of that thing up there. In that case, you can see the decline is very, very steady because of the fact that my effort was very, very steady. And ironically, I ended up with 0% when all was said and done. Like I literally emptied the tank. Now, was that accurate? I don't know, it was close. Like I would say I was absolutely beat after seven hours of riding in the sun. I would also say though, I probably could have gone maybe another five to 10 kilometers with the right motivation, but I think it's relatively close to where it needs to be. Next up, we got a biggie. You can finally actually change your settings on a phone for the watch. It's as simple as that. You can now go ahead and configure almost all the settings on the watch from the phone itself. So that'd be data pages, data fields, uh, the actual settings like GPS settings, workout settings, virtually everything is changeable from your smartphone to the watch. You can go to configure different sport profiles. Almost everything is now available on the smartphone. There are like a handful of features you'll find here and there that you can't do. For example, you can't use the map manager from the smartphone to configure the watch. So you got to do that from the watch itself, but almost everything like day-to-day -day usage can now be configured on the phone itself. Now, there's certainly some opportunity for Garmin to improve a few things here over time. For example, this is like one user interface hell. It's basically just a gigantic whole pile of settings. It's like they looked at it and went, yeah, that's 
that'll do, donkey. Man, I get it. I've often said, stop trying to boil the ocean with respect to this. Stop trying to fix all the things, just start somewhere. And to be fair, they've started somewhere. Next up is a relatively quick and easy one, which is the new Garmin Ski View. Now, Ski View is essentially just a rebranded version of their skiing stuff in the past, except with some notable changes. Number one is that you've now got resort names shown, as well as all the run names are shown. And number two, cross-country ski trails are now added into the maps, whereas previously those didn't exist at all. Also notable here is that the ski maps are actually preloaded on all watches, so base, solar, sapphire, it doesn't really matter, mostly because it's just small enough, it's about 250 megs for those details, so it's something that fits easily across all the SKUs without much impact. Okay, next up we got the new Gen 4 optical heart rate sensor has been added to the Phoenix 7 series. This is something Garmin introduced a little under a year ago with the Venue 2 series and then added to the 945 LTE last summer. And it's essentially just their latest version of their optical heart rate sensor. That sensor is responsible for your 24 by 7 heart rate as well as your workout heart rate, also breathing rate and pulse ox or your blood oxygen level all comes from that sensor. In terms of accuracy, I find in general it's pretty good. Uh, my results here were pretty much consistent with what I saw on the Venue 2 and the 945, which is to say that it works across a wide variety of sports. It even does well, in my case, in interval workouts, both running as well as cycling. Uh, but where it tends to struggle a little bit is things where your wrists are very, very tight. Uh, for example, downhill descending on a bike. In that case, it's not quite as optimal, but you can still always connect an Amp Plus or Bluetooth smart heart rate sensor uh, if the accuracy isn't good enough for you. I've also got all those heart rate accuracy details in the in-depth review that I mentioned earlier on, which then dives right into the next one, which is the new health snapshot feature. This is something that was also introduced on the Venue 2 last year, and it basically is a two minute test where you sit down and you do nothing, which is like my kind of test. I like this sort of thing. In this test, it's going to measure five core things. Your resting heart rate, your breathing rate, your stress levels, your pulse ox or blood oxygenation level, as well as your HRV. And after the end of the two minutes, it creates a little report both on the watch as well as on Garmin Connect. And you can even export out that as a PDF if you want to. And while that's handy, the one downside, there's no way to trend the HRV values. And ostensibly, the reason for doing a health snapshot is that you can control the exact time it's done. So you can say every day, five minutes after I wake up, for example, to do a health snapshot so it's consistent. But in this case, you can't easily see are those values consistent over time. So that's something I like to see is the way to trend just my health snapshot metrics over time to see if those things are changing in a more consistent way. Next up, a couple of quick activity profile changes. Garmin has added a new activity profile or sport profile for kiteboarding as well as kite surfing. They've also added a new feature called Speed Pro. And on top of that, they've rolled in the high intensity interval training uh, workout or structured workouts that they've introduced on the Venue 2 series. Additionally, Garmin has added a new chart afterwards in running mode, so it will automatically plot your run, walk, and standing portions. Speaking of tracking, Garmin has also added new historical trends for the race predictor feature. So if you were to go dive into the menus and into the VO2 max menu, you'll see your VO2 max change over time. But one of the things that drives behind the scenes is the race prediction features for your 5K, 10K, half marathon, and marathon times. But there's no way to see if those race predictions were actually changing over time. Now you can. When you look at those widgets, you see a little graph to see if they're trending or changing. But the key thing to remember is that those race predictions are driven largely in part by the VO2 max estimate. And the VO2 max estimate is in turn most accurate when you're doing high intensity workouts. So things that really push your body and allow the watch to figure out, are you actually at the edge of what you're capable of? Which is to say that it's most accurate if you go off and do a hard tempo run or a really hard interval workout versus just doing a lot of steady state workouts. Okay, for this next one regarding solar, I've got to pull up my handy dandy notes because there's a lot of numbers about to fly your way. But essentially, Garmin has increased the battery life via solar in three core ways. Number one is they've increased the size of the solar panel itself by 54% compared to the previous generation, for example, the 7X to the 6X. Number two, they've increased the efficiency of the solar panel. So in other words, how much energy does it get from the sun? And number three, they've increased the efficiency of the underlying hardware and OS itself. So that means changes to the chipsets and what's used internally the unit itself, as well as changes to the firmware and the software that runs on it to be more battery efficient. All of which results in this gigantic chart of changes to battery levels across the different models. It also means that the solar ring is more visible than it would have been on the 6 Series because it is actually quite a bit bigger in terms of the actual surface area on the watch itself. Now in terms of Garmin's numbers there, they reference 3 hours a day at 50,000 lux conditions. Uh, for context, right now, this exact moment, the 7S is showing me full sun at roughly 60,000 lux hours. Uh, now this is the middle of winter here in January, um, but I'm also in a place that's clearly very, very sunny. So for some people that may not use a GPS side of the watch a lot, you probably could get forever power if you're spending a fair 
bit of time outdoors through work or just simply enjoying the outdoors. Uh, but for other people that are spending a lot of time with GPS, either indoors or in the winter or places that aren't that sunny, you're probably still gonna have to charge it just about the same as you used to. Next up, there are a slew of graphical changes in the user interface. Uh, these come in a bunch of different places. So I'm just kind of rattle through them. Uh, first off, when you finish a workout, you'll see that the way it shows that summary data is now a little bit different than the past, a little more clear, especially on the training focus areas. It makes that kind of more obvious. The next area is that you'll see new charts that are available as data fields. Uh, so here's an example of a chart during a hike uh, showing my heart rate as well as my elevation. Uh, but you can customize your charts however you want, simply as new data fields that actually have charts within them. So that's kind of cool. Oh, and the one other benefit of the touchscreen is that on the watch face now, if you were to go ahead and long hold on any of those given uh, data points there, for example, your steps, it'll bring you right to the steps widget for a deeper dive into that data. Another new feature added is the Garmin Connect IQ store on the watch itself. Now this allows you to go ahead and browse some top app recommendations. It doesn't allow you to browse the entire app store, so consider it like a very basic first gen version of this, but this is the first time we've seen it on the watch itself. Garmin teased this last fall as part of their Connect IQ Developer Summit, uh, and now it's here on the watch. And last but not least, yeah, it's kind of least. It's a couple of hardware things. Uh, first off, it's a tiny bit thinner, uh, and then number two, they've gone to add button guards. So around that top right-hand button, the stop and start button there, you've now got this little bit of kind of like protective area that keeps your jacket from pressing that stop and start button uh, while you're out doing workouts or whatever the case may be. And then two, they've added like a layer to the top poles there uh, for better protection and styling. Uh, so as I said, it's not super exciting, but you know, for some people it's like their jam okay so with all those new features covered where do we stand on things well overall it's very very good both in terms of like day-to-day -day usage as well as sport tracking it's largely spot on the challenge though that I've got is that I've also been using the Epics as well, side by side, like Epics on one wrist, Phoenix 7 on the other wrist. And as good as the Phoenix 7 is, the Epics display is just so much better. Uh, and the battery life there is pretty solid. I'm getting six days consistently on that watch across the board with workouts and stuff like that, including always on mode. So for me and my daily usage where I don't need to go out and do like a 70 hour workout or something like that, I am perfectly fine with Epics. And the things like the solar and the flashlight, as great as they may be, I really prefer that nicer end display. Now, of course, in addition to this video, I also have a user interface video on the Phoenix 7. So if you wanna go through like a really long form, I think it's like 30 to 40 minutes long, uh, a video of just walking through all these features step by step a little more slowly a bit more casual then check out that video up in the corner there or always just simply hit the subscribe button for plenty more sports technology goodness because january is packed this week is packed with new things and you don't want to miss any of it with that have a good one